Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Neely, the second brother of the four Leprechaun brothers. And we have a special treat for you this time on our show. A guy coming to you all the way from across the world in another place called California. Well, no, brother. Actually, he's from Britain. But he came to California from there, and now he's in California. Britain's in California? No, Britain's not in California. Britain's in Britain. California's in California. So which place is Mr. Vance from? Well, right now, he's from California. So where'd he get the accent from? Well, he got the accent from Britain. But you said he was from California. No, he's from California now. He's originally from Britain. How can you be from two places at the same time? Oh, uh, let's just roll the show and I'll go find some maps. So here we are, folks, with Basil and Mr. Simon Vance. Enjoy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here we are with Mr. Simon Vance, narrator maestro of the audiobook world from down in uh, California, the sunny side of the state, of the, of the country, I should say. And uh, hello, Simon. Welcome. Hey, Basil. Welcome Good. virtually to Alaska. Yeah, yeah, I've never been to Alaska. Sort of not quite on my, uh, on my route home, you know. So. Yeah, yeah it, is, it is a bit out of the way. Yeah. But uh, but you should come up sometime. It'd be great if we could have like some kind of APA mixer up here because it's just me and one other person that yeah. narrate from here that I'm aware of at least. Anyway, I, I wanted to chat with you today about your history in audiobooks. What uh, now? You started out prior to audiobooks. You were a BBC uh, TV presenter or radio presenter. Um, I mean, yeah, my my career began in radio. Um, after I left university, I, I spent a year driving a bus because that's what people do. And then I, uh, I went back to my hometown and uh, I'd done summer jobs at a local radio station, BBC mm. Radio Brighton. And I, I went back there and a job, I, I took on part-time job. And then, then a full-time job came up and I went for it and got it. And a year later, I moved up to London um, uh, and joined BBC Radio 4, which is their flagship um, right, right. voice speech network. And I became a newsreader and presenter there. And that's really, I did that for, for nearly 10 years, but that was when I first got connected with audiobooks because I, um, I had a friend who'd done that job before me. <clears throat> and he, in his spare time, had worked for the RNIB Talking Book Service. That's the Royal National Institute for the Blind's Talking Book Service which was very close to Broadcasting House in central London. Um, and I was up in London. I didn't know anybody. And we were doing odd shifts. We did overnights and weekends and, and so on. And I had a lot of time off in the week. Didn't know anybody to go meet, hang out with. So I, um, I, I decided to volunteer as well. And that's when I started. So that's about 30-something years ago. Wow. I, did that, I did that for the eight years, nine years following that before I came to California. So you did that consecutive with the radio career. Yeah, I did at the same Good. time. Yeah, so so it was one afternoon a week. Oh, and okay. Say it was just up the just up the road from um, from Broadcasting House, and I uh, we got paid. I think it was uh, a couple of pounds travel fees, you know, traveling expenses. Right. But but I did that consistently every week. Um, oh. You know, it took a long time to record. If you're only doing, try to get about two hours finished audio oh, wow. in an afternoon. Wow. Yeah, that uh, that would take a while to get a whole book together. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I did oh. the Dune. I did the Dune books, all five of the Dune books, and I think mm. it took over a year. You did the Dune books through that, through the RNIB. I did it for the RNIB for the first time. Wow, yeah. wow. That's probably. I, I assume that helped you be very familiar with them by the time you did them uh, later. My sons love those, by the way. My one son, he listened to all of them back to back, and right. uh, like two months worth of him walking around with his MP3 player with you in his head. So. Oh, that's nice. Well, so I do it about every 20 years. I first read them in about 68, or started mm. in 68 when the first one, I think, when was the first one? 67, 68, something yeah, like that. Yeah, that. Uh, then, so it was 1988 when I did them in London, and it was about 2008 when I did them over here. Mm. About. So it's like every 20 years. So somewhere around 2028, I'll pick them up again. And yeah. Get, get the redo, and then we can, we can hear you in all your stages of, <laughs> your, of your voice, the youth, the, the, the adult, and the senior. <laughs> well, that's cool. Very cool. Um, so that's how you got into audiobook narrating at the beginning. What brought you from London to the U.S.? Um, 
I've, I've had a hankering to be a full-time actor for a long time. I mean, as a child, I went to a, a Saturday morning drama school and the bug never left me, you know. I, 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 at the beginning, I just didn't think it was a, a suitable career for a grown man to be an actor and play silly games and so on. But as I, as I got older, I realized I still wanted to do it. Um, and I, uh, when I was at the BBC, I kept thinking, how can I, how can I move over to, to acting? I'm finding radio a bit two-dimensional. I did actually, uh, I, I auditioned for a newsreader post uh, in, in one of the regional stations that produced national newsreaders later on, and I didn't, I got very far, but I'm not a journalist, so I, I didn't crack the last little few steps. Um, and, and then I, I, it was while I was at um, Talking Books for the Blind, in one of the breaks, I was sitting there with a bunch of actors and, and other presenters, a lot of West End actors would come in, and somebody turned to me and said, what are you, are you an actor? And I said, no, I'm a, a newsreader, but I... In my head, I wanted to be an actor, and from that was about that was about eighty-seven, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I decided I'm going to try, so I auditioned for drama school three years in a row to mm -hmm. do postgraduate drama. Got accepted, but I couldn't leave the BBC because I was being paid far too much money. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, and at that point, it was just too much of a risk. And then <clears throat> I did do am some what I called amateur theatricals in England. There's a very mm -hmm. clear distinction in England between union work and non-union work. Mm. professional theatre and amateur theatre. But I did that in London, in, in Wimbledon. I did a few musicals, and mm. one of them I met a woman who's an American who had just got divorced, and she was wanting to come. Well, we got on very well, and she wanted to come back to the States um, because her parents were getting old, and uh, she wanted to be near them. And I was thinking, hmm, because by that time we had a child. Uh, mm. and, and I, and You just, got on very well. We got on very well, very quickly. Um, <laughs> I'm skimming over stuff here, but it's a bit different. <laughs> so so um, we, uh, we decided about 92. Um, she, she left her job in the UK. She was working in advertising. She could work over here, and she could earn more over here than over there. So mm. became a, I became a sort of a kept man. <laughs> I came over here. I, I, I managed to break away, do the complete break from the BBC, mm. um, cut through Auntie Beebe's apron strings, as they call them, and um, and came over here and set up over here as an actor, um, but uh, never, you know. I, mean, I was getting good work in the theatre, but it didn't pay very well. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I needed to find something else to do. And one of her brothers-in-law, one of my a brother, one of my brothers-in-law, um, knew someone who worked for Blackstone Audiobooks in Ashford. Mm. And it was David Case, who's no longer with us now. He died a few years ago. But um, he introduced me to Craig Black at Blackstone in '93, in and um, the rest, as they say, is history. Wow, wow. It's been 20, 22 years now over here that I've been recording books commercially. Right, right. And been a consistent career for you. I mean, you were one of the most. Yeah, it's been, it's been really good. I mean, it, it, never, it was never something. I didn't. And I know other people have stories like Scott Brick and so on, always. You know, they suddenly they wanted to be an audiobook narrator, so they found a way in to do it. For me, it was very accidental. It was something I just happened to do. Mm. Um, and I took it on 20 years ago here because I, it was a way of making money. It was something I could do. Right. And I had a knack for it. I never thought of myself. And it's a, you know, my wife kicks me over this, but I never thought of myself as being that good at it. Uh, because I... I just did it in my little box at home. Well, we, I began in the garage, the corner of the garage, and then I moved into a, a closet, and I moved and slowly developed until I got, you know, one of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, so I never thought of myself as, as as being particularly good at it until I guess it was about 2001. I got my uh, first um, audio file, earphone award, and then I think I was nominated for an Audi about two years later, and and mm. slowly, and, and then. That was when the MP3 boom was happening. You know, the iPod and, and audio books began to get a higher profile. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I finally went to New York for one of these big meetings and, um, and found people sort of happy to meet me. Mm. <laughs> so, oh, Simon Van. Ah, great. And uh, I suddenly realized, oh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm better at this than I thought. Um, so it was a long apprenticeship. You know, my apprenticeship, in a sense, was in England for, for the eight years, and then I started working over here. But it was 10 years of, of just solid work. And, and yes, there were ups and downs. In those days, uh, certainly the end of the last century, so to speak, mm. there were good months and bad months and some terrible months because I only worked for a couple of companies, and, and they'd send maybe one book a month or one every two months or three right, months right. or something. 
and sometimes they'd be busier than that. So it was difficult. They were difficult years, and I never saw it as a career at that point. Mm. It wasn't something I ever thought I'd, I'd end up doing for the rest of my life. It's changed in the last 15 years. It's been extraordinary with the growth and, and the fact that, um, yeah, I finally recognize I, I can actually do this. <laughs> and it is something that I could do. But, of course, I, I'm never content. I, and, and that was it, five, six years ago, I thought, oh, I can settle down now. I bought a house. Uh -huh. uh, uh, decided to, uh, I could be doing this for the rest of my life. That was when I finally said, I can do this for the rest of my life. So for about a year or two, that was fine. And then I got restless, realized I still wanted to act. Um, and so right now I'm trying to blossom out. I'm down in LA more often than I'm up in San Francisco now, mm. um, uh, auditioning and, and trying to get TV and film work. So mm. I will not ever give up audiobooks, but I'm trying to sort of spread myself out a bit. Try some, some other avenues to, to add to your bouquet of skills. That's it. That's it. My yeah, there you go. So how would you compare audiobook narration to the time that you spent with the BBC work-wise and, and skills-wise? Oh, I always thought it's, for me, the whole thing was a, a perfect storm of skills. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it goes back to my childhood. I grew up in the, in the uh, you know, 60s. Uh, BBC radio was fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. Not just the comedy shows, but the drama, the spoken word, and even on television, we had we had uh, an afternoon show when you got back from school called Jack and Nori, um, where a, an actor or actress would sit and read for fifteen minutes to the camera. Um, huh. And of course, on the radio with Radio Four, you got Book at Bedtime, The Morning Story, uh, The Afternoon Serial, all those things. So. I grew up being read to. Mm. Not my parents did. I, I think when I was very young, but uh -huh. you know, but then the BBC took on the parenting aspect and um, mm. and read to me a lot. So so that's going through my head all the time. Um, I'm I'm being trained as an actor at this Saturday morning drama school that I used to go to. Um, all those things are going on. Um, I'm a good sight reader. I've always been a good reader. You know, in school when they hand things around and they. You know, I can I could read I could you know, read flowingly or however you put it right um, from a very early age. So all that's going on. Then I get into the radio side of things, and I am tested in so many other areas. You know, you, you throw in scripts and read this and read that, and you go and read this in that style, and you have to do the announcements for this in that style, and you have to match mm -hmm. the music, and you have to all these things, and you have to bear mm -hmm. in pronunciation. So you've got that alertness going on. And at the same time, especially in local radio, you're doing all the technical stuff as well. You know, you're twiddling right, the knobs right. and you're interviewing somebody and somebody's talking in your ear saying, ask them this or whatever. You know, right, right. Let's do that. And oh my God, we've lost, you know, Birmingham or something. That's careless of you, but we'll have to fill in with something else. So, um, you know, I'm thinking on all these different levels. So when it comes to audiobooks, I'm, I'm already primed. Mm. I mean, I love reading. Um, I, I, I understand a lot about how people listen, you know, the, the, how things work best, um, and all these things, and, and the, just reading off the page, you know, I'm thrown stuff at the last minute, and I can I can sight read really well, and that's all these things go together. Um, so in terms of the difference between radio, how my work at the BBC, th there isn't really a lot of difference. Mm. The one thing is that instead of doing a two-minute news bulletin or a, or a one-minute, you know break between programs and, and ad living. I've got all the words in front of me and I do it for hours. <laughs> that's, that's the one thing is the stamina. Right, you know, right. It's still a little lonelier. I'm on my own in here. And at the BBC, there was an engineer or a producer or journalists and so on. So it's lonelier, but, but apart from that. Now, as you were coming up, though, you were working out of the producer studios, I assume. Or have you always been working from a home studio? No, audiobooks, I've always done home studio stuff. Oh, okay. Not... not 100%, but but mostly. I began, um, I think I mentioned it, the corner of the garage. Mm -hmm. Stone, Blackstone Audiobooks was one of the few who'd used home narrators. Oh, okay. So I was never in one of I, I got called into one of the... Well, I used going... I, I could go to their studios in Ashland and work there and visit Ashland, and I did that a couple of times. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, everything I, I did was at home. Um, and that's why... I think why I wasn't aware how um, 
how good I was because <laughs> I just do the books and send them off, do the books and send them off. I didn't have somebody over the other side of the glass saying, really good, son. I love what you're doing. Right, right. You're just kind of floating, wondering, did I do it right? Well, they haven't fired me yet. It, so. Well, I'm not necessarily worrying about whether I did it right because this wasn't a career I was choosing to do. Mm. It wasn't something I absolutely needed to be, um, you know, to think of myself as I've got to be good. I've got to be better than this. I, mm. I, I've got to make a future here. No, right. I was just reading. So there was no pressure, which I think made a lot a lot easier on me. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so so I was in the corner of the garage and then a closet and, I, and so on. And um, around about 2002, I think it was. Yeah, it was about 2002 uh, when I started meeting people in New York. And I got invited to record a couple of books in New York. I mm. um, had a contact uh, in Seattle, Kate Fleming, who unfortunately also died in terrible accident several years ago, but she um, she invited me up to Seattle and I did a series of books with her in her studio. She was not, not dissimilar to this, but she had it connected so she sat outside and monitored. Mm. So it was like having a or producer. You have a direct and produce right there. Like a professional studio. But only, I mean, the number of times I, I've been in a studio, count on my fingers. Oh, wow. Wow. So, and now since, uh, you know, I did a couple of books and one of them was for Macmillan and, and um, the woman said, uh, well, you, you're, you know, you're pretty good. You, you got your own home studio, right? And I said, yes. Well, we'll probably hire you there from now on. So I think they just wanted to check me out. Just um, wanted to make sure it was, yeah. I'm, you know, they could trust me as a self-directed narrator. So I've done almost everything in the last 10 years has been in my studio. Oh, excellent. Excellent. What uh, the home studio thing has grown a lot since the MP3 explosion and the uh, ACX and Audible really opening things up. The uh, what would you recommend for all these new narrators that are coming in, trying to get a foothold into this as a hobby or as a career? Uh, how would you recommend a person get started into this, especially if they do decide they want this to be a career? Yeah, it's a difficult question for me to answer because, I mean, for everyone, it's a it's a different path. Right. Everybody has a different way into this industry. Um, especially somebody who's been in it for, for as long as I have. You know, you talk to Scott Grover, you know, all these, Grover Gardner, and you talk to all these people who've been doing it for years, and they all found a different way in. Um, and, and I, because I'm not looking to get in, and because I don't teach, I don't coach mm -hmm. people, I'm not really up on that, the, the correct answers to those questions. What I used to say was, um, you know, do it the way I did, which is volunteer do voiceover, mm. do, do it for the blind and so on. That's not so practical these days. And this is mm. part of the problem is that audiobooks has become an industry that people look at and go, oh, I want to get in now and I've got to be successful. I've got to get work. I've got to get the money coming in. And you, you don't have the time to do it on the side, most mm -hmm. of the time, you know, to go away and spend your time doing that because it, it's, it, yeah, there just isn't that patience, if you like. Um, but there are also many more opportunities mm -hmm. to have a go, uh, like ACX. You know, I think that's probably the. the I, I have a sort of love-hate relationship with the way the industry has has grown in that sense because it there's been this feeling that anybody with a piece of elastic and a tin can and a sticky tape and a few nails can record. <laughs> Right, you know, right, you've got right. a microphone for twenty quid. You could twenty dollars. You can you can record on your you know your two hundred dollar laptop and stuff like that, which is true up to a point. Oh yeah. Um, but there's there is so much more to it. So much more to the to the art and craft of narrating. It ta that takes years. Um, and I I'm not sure people are willing to wait that long to do that work. Mm -hmm. You know. Because you can only be taught so much. Um, you know, you can be taught technique, technicalities, how you do this, the mechanics of things. Right. right. But it's the art. And art takes time. And there's, unfortunately, a lot of people are rushing in. And, and, and now with, with ACX, and one of the criticisms I think I have of ACX is that it's, it leaves the choice of the narrator up to the author, um, not to a professional broadcaster or a professional, you know, like, you know, the big companies, when they were the only ones doing it, they would choose this book goes with this person, this book goes with that person. Authors don't don't really get what a narrator does. Right. Uh, right. And they'll just go, eh, you know, he's the right price, I'll use him. Right. Um, yeah. and it's, you see a lot of those conversations online 
with narrators who become frustrated because of that. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes. Um, do you think you, you you mentioned you don't do coaching? Do you think it's important for narrators to receive coaching? Yeah. Or, yeah. I looked at that. Uh, you know, I, I see that question, and I is it important to be trained? And I don't think anybody's going to say, nah, no, <laughs> no, you know, once you've got your first book, you can turn around and just keep narrating that. Nah, it's <laughs> once you've got it, you've got it. Um, no, I think it is. Um, but we can do that ourselves. Um, <laughs> it's, it's about being aware. You know, for me, as I say, I grew up listening to uh, books being read to me all the time. And in England, they still do that. There's still a lot of reading going on. Um, here, so, so if you were in England, you can actually go on the internet and Radio 4 is one of the um, internet stations that you can find, BBC Radio 4, and you'll find a lot of stuff being read to you and it's good to listen to that. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can teach yourself an awful lot by listening to other narrators. So what you do over here if you can't get that is, is, is go listen to audiobooks. Mm -hmm. Listen to the top audiobooks, the top narrators, um, and try to figure out what it is. Um, I think uh, it, there is value in finding the right teacher. Um, there can be a sort of an accelerated learning process in that. Mm -hmm. They can teach you what to listen for. You may not be sure how to listen to something like that. Right. Um, right. The difficulty is finding the right teacher. There are, there are many people out there who, who I think, um, well, I don't have direct experience. I know personally a lot of teachers who I, I would, you know, highly recommend. Um, well, I know a few anyway. Um, uh, and I don't know any personally I wouldn't recommend, but I know from looking around that there are people who are trying to teach. And when I look at the examples that they're giving or their own experience, I think, you know, you don't really have it. It's hard. I mean, it's, it's not as easy as some of them make, make it appear. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a big, big rush on the whole thing about ACX, you know, all this money is out there to be made. They're saying there's lots of money. Get out there, go get yourself. It's not that simple. There's much more to it. So seek out the right teacher, get the right advice. And, and yes, continue to do that. I mean, I, I don't, uh, now I mentioned I've been here 22 years. I, I think the only lesson I got, I worked in New York on one book with Paul Allen Rubin, mm. a Grammy winning audiobook producer who I, teaches now. And I think he taught me more in an afternoon of studio work than I'd ever learned before. And I was, you know, I was good up to that point, good enough to get hired to go into New York and so on. But I think he taught me uh, certain things to be aware of that I, I hadn't been, um, that maybe I did things naturally, and, but, but it, it gave me something to focus on. Um, but I've never done any, I, I've never had a mentor or a trainer in, mm -hmm. in, in audio books, but I think it's something you can, con I, I continue to listen. Um, I actually listen to myself sometimes, sometimes when I'm doing a series and it's been a year or so since I did that series. I may have notes and stuff, but I, um, especially right now as I drive a lot between San Francisco and LA, um, you know, every few weeks I'll be driving up and down. And if I've got a book coming up, there's another in a series that I've done, you know, a year or two before, I'll download the book, my book, and I'll listen to it. To so impress yourself on what you did for that first one. That's a, you know, yeah, that's a great thing to do. You know, it's time consuming, but you know, when you got a long drive on, that's, uh, that's okay. You know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I know I listen to audiobooks all the time. Uh, in, mm. in my day job, in addition to what I do in the studio, uh, I have a lot of free mental time while my hands are busy. So yeah. uh, it's a great way to, uh, like you said, I think that's the most valuable training tool is yeah. listening to successful narrators and not necessarily emulating them, but learning what they do to no. make it right. No, the big mistake is, is to emulate them, it, it, but it's... It, yeah, it's, it's being aware. It's, and a teacher is useful pointing out what you need to listen to. They could, yes, they can look at you, they can listen to you and say, well, you're doing this, you're doing that, and you should try doing this. But, um, you know, I, I could teach things and then uh, and the next teacher along will teach something completely different or the next one will then negate anything I said. and Because it's all personal choices. It's finding out what works for you. Right, it's, right. And, and the only two ways, you've got to listen to what other people do uh, and then you've got to go in the studio and play with yourself, so to speak. You know. <laughs> you've got to do your own thing. Let's say. Let's now, remember that. the context, children. Yes. Remember yes. this context. <laughs>
Yeah, definitely. In yeah, very good, very good information. Well, I have my 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 four housemates uh, have some a question they want to ask you, okay. and uh, they uh, they thought long and hard about this. So I'll call them up. Hey, uh, Feely, Feely, yes, yes, Mr. Basil, come on up. Mr. Vance is here. Oh, Mr. Vance, Mr. Vance, we wanted to talk to you. We've been listening to that Imagica book, and that. Uh, uh, do you actually have magic? Um, no. I mean, people think I might have magic in my voice, but no, I don't have oh. magic. Oh. Well, you're very convincing nonetheless. Very uh, convincing. So, we really like that book, and we have this question we made for you. My name is Feely, by the way. I'm the eldest of the brothers that lives here. And my next brother, Neely, he is going to ask the question uh, for you. And we'll find out. But Bertold had to put the question together because he's really the only one smart enough to come up with some of these things sometimes. Uh, he is the youngest and has been hit on the head probably less than the rest of us. So, so now my brother Neely will ask you the question. Here we go. Okay. Hello, Mr. Vance. This is Neely. And uh, I have a question for you. It's a hypothetical question. It's a question that, that puts you in a situation that is hypothetical. And, and asks you for an answer. And here we go. Uh, and um, you are an an you're at an antique store and pick up a lovely glass bottle. The glass seems to change color as you raise it to the light. With a sudden hiss, whoosh, and a pop, a genie bursts out from the bottle and says, you must choose between being turned either into an ancient Greek hero or an alcoholic beverage for your wife's consumption. She will be unaware of your plight, but only after choosing your story from a library shelf or ordering your drink at a bar will she then be able to revive you back to normal through a series of magical hiccups and burps to bring you whole again. Upon your restoration, she will ever after refer to you by the nickname based on what you turned into. So, what do you think of that question with an answer? Well, I love simple questions. Um, oh, we like to make them simple. Good, no. good. Well, you've certainly done so in this case. Um, Thank you very much. Okay, well, my knowledge of Greek mythology is not great. Uh, so, you know, Greek and Roman mythology. If I think of a, an ancient... Uh, see, I'm... Of the two, of the two, I mean... I think my wife isn't much of a drinker. So I'm, I, I'm going to lean across to the other side. I think I'd be a sort of a... What were the archetypes of, uh, in Greek mythology? I, I want to be some sort of hero, some type of hero. I, I'm someone who's never satisfied, uh, who, who's always, you know, looking for the next adventure. Um, because I've tried, as I mentioned, I've tried settling down, did it for a little while, and then go, no, there's more, there's got to be more. So I think, I think uh, that's the direction I'd go in. But I, okay, now I said a simple question. I've got a, what was the rest of the, that part of the question? So you'll get your choice of being turned into these two things, but you stay that thing until yeah. your wife either gets a book about you from the library, about your Greek hero, or orders you from a bar. Okay, well, so I'm a Greek hero of some sort, um, and now I've got to decide what, the name, my, my nickname? Who would you be, and, and yeah, what, would she, what nickname would she give you afterwards? I can't pick up. I should I should have looked at a book of Greek mythology heroes and whatever. Um, see, there's there's uh, the only ones I can think of things like Achilles, but he he damages, he damages his heel. Um, uh, I'm I'm I, woof. I'm I'm getting lost here because I I don't know who to who to choose. But it'd be some sort of uh, you know. Well, well, if he turns you into let's say. Uh... What's the one guy? Agamemnon. Agamemnon. Yeah, okay. Agamemnon. A nice kingly sort of fellow. A nice kingly sort of fellow. You look like you could be an Agamemnon. Okay, okay. Okay. So what, what would she nickname you then? Aggie. All... Aggie? <laughs> That'll work. That'll work. So that's what we'll be calling you when we see you at, at APAC now. Oh, okay. You call me Aggie. Say, hello, yeah. hello, Aggie Vance. I'll try, I'll, I'll come along in my uh, robes. Ah, yes, with a sword. With a sword. I have a sword, and maybe a trident. I think the TW, uh, whatever the uh, security might be a little concerned about that, but um, 
Yeah, TSA gets on us all the time. Right. When we travel. Well, they would, yeah. Um, okay, okay. <laughs> I tell you what, though, I, was, I, I, I also think when you think about the, the... If my wife drank whiskey, I'd be very happy to be turned into a nice single malt. Mm. And I'd, I'd like a 25-year-old, because I think when I was 25, I was so much fitter and healthier. <laughs> and I just wish I knew then what I know now. If that uh, very so cool. 25-year-old malt whiskey would be my other choice. <laughs> that, would be, that would be our choice every time, actually. Right. So. So, uh, as a matter of fact, our grandfather made whiskey that uh, we, we have still some bottles of it from the 1930s. Well, bring some with you. When yes, I yes. That. It'll be very good if I can keep Neely and Boffin out of the stock. Oh, okay. So. Well, thank you, guys. Any other questions you have? No, I think that does it. We're going to go back and finish listening to that uh, Magicka book and uh, see, because we're kind of stuck in it, and we want to get back to Earth now. Yeah, back to Earth. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much, boys. Go away. And uh, thank you, Simon, for a wonderful chat. Great getting to know you here over the interwebs and uh, looking forward to seeing you at APAC. And uh, it's going to be a good time there. Okay. Well, thank you, Basil. It's been good chatting to you. All righty. Okay. Now, see this map? The map shows you California is over here on the west side of America. Britain is over here in the middle of the ocean. Oh, he's from the middle of the ocean. Oh, wait a minute. That's right next to Ireland. Hey, I know that place. So he's actually from Britain in the first part, but then he came to America and now he's from here. He's like a naturalized American Britain person. Kind of like us, except we're not naturalized anywhere. Well, you're not natural in any way, shape or form anyway. Just what are you instinguating? Oh, gentlemen, if I may arbitrate this here argument, I would say that the person in question, being Mr. Vance, is from England originally, and England being part of the United Kingdom would make him both English and British, and since he lives here in America, he's also American, and since he's from California, He's a Californian, and I believe he lives somewhere near San Francisco, so therefore he would also be San Franciscan. So, what does that mean? What do we call a man like that? Well, you could just say all of those names and say he's a British, English, American, California, San Franciscan. Or, you can do what I like to do and combine bits and pieces of the word together and make it easy. Like this, which would be something like, Mr. Simon Vance is a Britangler Mara California Franciscan. Oh, well, that makes sense. Britangler Mara California, Britangler Mara California, Risker, Rockefeller, Britangler. Okay, I just call him Mr. Vance. Bye. Oh, by the way, this show is copyright 2015 by Sandman Production Studios of Alaska and Basil, and us too. We're copyrighted. Are we copyrighted? I think so.